All right, so I, I think that we are ready to start. Um, so thank you everyone for connecting today. Um, so today we're going to discuss um, the interesting connection between the electrochemical processes in liquid environments and the surface science, which is often requires high vacuum. So because a liquid and a high vacuum are certainly incompatible with each other, uh, many techniques that are widely used in surface science cannot be applied in electrochemical experiments. And so um, as a result, still there are many attempts to breach the gap between the surface science and electrochemistry. When you combine them properly, I mean, in principle, you can gain a much better insight into the fundamental processes at the solid liquid interfaces. But at the same time, of course, this combination is pretty tricky to do. Um, so in today's colloquium, uh, we're hosting Jörg Libuda, who's a professor and the chair of interface research and catalysis at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany, and who's a very widely recognized expert in both surface sciences and electrochemistry. So um, generally, much of his work um, is very fundamental, and it's being devoted to things such as absorption, catalysis, and electrochemistry on single crystalline surfaces, with the overall game aim, as I see it at least, to understand and explore this phenomenon. So, York, uh, now the stage is yours. Yeah, uh, Andrew, thank you, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, let me say I, I really feel honored to get a chance to speak in this uh, in the framework of this um, lecture series. Uh, I think it's a Excellent idea, actually, to have such a lecture series that has a strong focus on, uh, let's say, fundamental aspects of electrochemistry. Um, and today, as you mentioned, I would like uh, to discuss uh, one particular aspect of such a fundamental approach. And uh, at point, I will share the screen, and you should be able to see the screen now. Uh, now, uh, as you pointed out, I will uh, discuss uh, the combination of uh, surface science and uh, electrochemistry yeah? and the challenges, let's call it like that, uh, that are associated with bringing these two uh, worlds together. Um, and yeah, well, uh, I, I realized, of course, that, you, uh, that you're recording this and, and uh, will put this video on uh, YouTube. And I realized for YouTube video, the, the title is way too long. Uh, so actually, I uh, came up with a shorter version of the title to explain what this presentation will be about. It will be about the reactive site at the um, electrode electrolyte interface. Yeah, and uh, we will discuss the, the, the question today how to identify the relevant site, how to make the relevant site, and how to test the relevant site. Um, now, as has been asked for for this um, uh, for this uh, colloquium, I've uh, subdivided my presentation in two parts. Uh, one, uh, the first is a is more tutorial part uh, where we'll discuss the methodological approaches that are associated uh, with bringing these two worlds together. Uh, and in the second part, uh, I will give some application examples. Yeah, very brief application examples from different fields. Um, the, uh, the first part is, is really basic. Yeah, so I think you don't need any um, yeah, strong background in electrochemistry or surface science or surface chemistry to really understand the idea. And I would like to invite every, everybody yeah, to, to, to also think about that challenge, uh, maybe come up with uh, ideas, suggestions. So uh, it's, it's really on a, on a very general um, level on the type of an overview. Yeah, in the second part, uh, this will be also um, yeah, from a, with, with not too many details. So I think everybody can, can follow the ideas. So uh, let us start uh, with the first part, um, the um, methodological approach. Uh, let us um, set the stage first. So uh, the things that I will be talking about are associated to what people call a material scan. Yeah, and you find this um, yeah, this this uh, term 
in uh, catalysis and heterogeneous catalysis and electric catalysis, but also in other fields of um, material science. So what, what do people mean if they say materials gap? So what you see here are some pictures of electrocatalytic materials. Yeah? So um, various types of materials, for instance, uh, you have a um, platinum, ruthenium, nanoparticle catalyst where these alloy nanoparticles sit on a carbon support, nanostructured carbon support. Uh, you have a um, mixed oxide catalyst uh, for oxygen ev uh, evolution reaction here. Uh, you have a mixed uh, oxide carbon, nanostructured carbon uh, catalyst again for oxygen revolution. Uh, what you're seeing here is a fuel cell catalyst that combines noble metals with oxide again on a conductive carbon surface. So there's one thing that these uh, systems have in common. Uh, they're pretty complicated. Yeah? So they're pretty complicated from a structural point of view, apparently, but also very complicated from a chemistry uh, point of view. So what are the species on the surface? What is the structure? Uh, what is the composition? So we would like to understand how chemical reactions proceed um, on such surfaces. Uh, what do we do? So what we normally do in both in surface science and in electrochemistry is we do um, what we call surface science type uh, experiments. Uh, we use single crystals, very simple single crystals. Um, where you have one defined type of site, prepare them in an environment that is as clean as possible, and then uh, look at the reaction. So uh, in electrochemical surface science, uh, this is particularly simple for some systems, namely for those systems that can be prepared by the method of flame annealing. In flame annealing, you just anneal single crystal uh, in the flame or by other means. Uh, clean the clean this crystal in that way, and then um, yeah, um, make sure that it doesn't uh, doesn't is, is not contamin. There's no contamination while you cool it down, and then you bring it into the electrolyte. So this is a very fast way of preparing and very convenient way of preparing clean surfaces. However, if you compare these uh, yeah ideal experiments and the real materials, it's quite apparent that they are quite different. Yeah, so, and the question, of course, is um, what actually can we learn from the surface science experiment on um, the performance and the chemistry on the real catalyst? Is this in any way transferable? Well, that is, uh, that is in very general terms, this material gaps, but I, I would like to take the chance here to go a little bit deeper into detail and, and think with, together with you, think a little bit about, uh, uh, about this question. Yeah, so what it really means to have a materials gap. So what exactly uh, is, uh, why or why exactly is this gap a problem? Yeah, so let's try to find out what exactly the problem is. And when we, when we, as soon as we have identified the different aspects of this problem, maybe we can find out how to access it. So um, what is the answer? You can uh, think yourself. So um, one, one aspect is certainly that on this real catalyst, you have many different sites. Yeah? So let's call that heterogeneity. Yeah? Heterogeneity is a problem. Then on top of that, uh, for the real materials, very often you don't know what the actual atomic structure of the, these sites is. Yeah? So we have a lack of characterization. Then I pointed out that we do have model systems uh, in electrochemistry, yeah? and there's a lot of experiments on these model systems. Um, but uh, these model systems are very often different uh, from the real catalysts. Why? Because people use the model systems that are easy to prepare. Uh, they don't use the model systems because they are relevant. Of course, they say so, yeah, including our group. Uh, of course, they say so. But in the end, you can only prepare the systems that are really easily prepared. Uh, so very often, uh, there's, a there's a gap. Um, sorry. 
Um, then uh, it has become clear over the last years uh, that very often the structure of the surfaces changes under reaction conditions. Yeah, so that's something that we call structural dynamics. Yeah, and finally, that's an issue and it's often ignored, not in this colloquium, uh, we've seen it before, but um, very often it's not really uh, investigated uh, what is the role of the solvent, the electrolyte, co-adsorbates, uh, modifiers that may be present um, in the reaction environment. So these are five big challenges. And now we can ask the question, what, how, could, how could we address? Now, what would be the ideal solution? Uh, we don't consider for the moment whether uh, our suggestions are realistic or not, but what can we in principle do? Well, um, if there are many different sites on the surface, you could say, oh, we can, we can test them all one by one. The question is, of course, is that possible? Do we have the capacity to do so? Um, if the structure of the site is not known, we can say, okay, we have to uh, characterize them in a better way. No? So um, uh, in ide identify all the structures, but do we have the methods to do so? Uh, if the structure of the model system is different from the real catalyst, um, we have to prepare the relevant sites. Yeah? But the question is, is it possible? Do we have the methods to uh, prepare one well-defined uh, relevant sites that we think uh, may, be, um, may, be, may be of interest? Uh, do we have the preparation methods? Um, if the structure changes under operation conditions, we need to follow that. Uh, so uh, we need in situ method that allow us to follow the structure of these systems, their structural evolution under reaction conditions, very important. And finally, uh, that's this challenge with the reaction environment. Well, so uh, we need to identify what the solvent does, what adsorbates do, what modifiers do. Now, again, do we have the methods to see them um, under working conditions? So what is needed? Uh, what is needed in the end? Yeah, I think there are three main things that we have to think about. First, about, first of all, how to characterize the real and model catalyst with really with atomic precision. Uh, so we need progress with respect to the methods. Uh, we need to choose the right model systems. If there are many sites, yeah, we need to tell what is the relevant site. So, so maybe um, there we can expect in the future a lot of input also from modeling theory. And finally, we have to prepare the right model systems with atomic precision and test them. Yeah, so we need progress in the preparation methods. Yeah, and these are, these are the three things that we should keep in mind. Now, um, I have to confess something at that point. Yeah, and uh, I think Andrew also mentioned it. Uh, I'm not an uh, electrochemist uh, um, yeah, uh, by, by education. Yeah, I'm a surface scientist by education. And I would like to show you one um, transparency that I already showed um, yeah, more than 20 years ago uh, when my group was still active, not in uh, electrochemistry so much, but more in the field of heterogeneous catalysis. And this, uh, this is this transparency that you see here. Yeah? So that is the summary how to build an atomically defined model system. Yeah, in this case for heterogeneous catalysis. But um, we could follow the, exactly the same ideas also in the field of electrochemistry. So the idea is to make sites that are really re relevant for the catalytic process. Yeah? So we could make them one by one by introducing different aspects of complexity where we think that they may play a ro role in the reaction. So we could start from a single crystal surface and then add, by, add, add one by one. Well, for instance, support material, metal particles, modifiers, multiple components, alloys, poisons, promoters, nanostructures, one by one. And we should try to keep these systems atomically defined all the way while we're adding this complexity. Yeah? So if we would achieve to do so, then we could correlate at any point the structure and composition of the systems to the chemical um, behavior, catalytic behavior. That is pretty much the idea 
um, of this model approach. So um, to what extent can we apply that to electrochemistry? Now, later on in the second part, I will show four application examples for my work very briefly, uh, where we try to follow this approach. And also, we'll talk about briefly about well-defined oxide surfaces, about nanoparticles and supports, about the surface modification by ionic liquids, and about molecular films, uh, functional molecular films on supports. Yeah, and all these rather complex model surfaces we make in our ultra vacuum, and then we bring into a working electrochemical environment to see how these systems behave when they're there. Uh, and uh, by doing so, we can then yeah, uh, use the knowledge uh, about the structure and correlate it with the functionality of the system. That is the idea. Now, I would like to point out one thing. Um, I would like to point out uh, that this approach, the idea of uh, combining ultra vacuum and uh, surface science uh, is not a new approach at all. So if you go back into the literature and follow the uh, evolution of this uh, approach over the decades, you find that it's actually going back to the very early days of surface science. Yeah? So you can go back more than 40 years and find this uh, idea in the literature. And it's been there all the time. Um, so there must be something fascinating about this idea. Yeah, and recently, I think there is a uh, renewed, very strong interest and a lot of achievements uh, along these lines. And um, yeah, the, the reason basically, I believe, is that recently there's been a lot of progress in point, uh, from the point of view of instrumentation. Yeah, and I will talk a little bit about this uh, instrumentation um, challenge uh, in a few minutes. Now, let me point out this, uh, this collection here is incomplete. Yeah? So if, you, if you're missing your work or your favorite work, I apologize. Um, um, I know it is incomplete. So let me, let me explain a little bit how it, how it works to, to connect the surface science world to uh, the electrochemical world. So I will show in the second part um, some um, model systems based on cobalt oxide. Yeah, and uh, the question is, how do you make them and how do you characterize them? So this is an example here that illustrates how to proceed. So typically, we proceed from a single crystal that we prepare in ultra vacuum, ultra clean, make sure that it's really well-ordered surface. And then uh, typically, there are recipes out there in the in the, in the world of surface science that tell you how to make an ordered, well-defined uh, system. For instance, a cobalt oxide 111 film. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, this is an example of a cobalt oxide 111 film. Um, uh, this system has been developed uh, and characterized um, in the group of uh, Klaus Heinz and Lutz Hammer, and now uh, by Alexander Schneider at our university in the Department of Physics. Um, and this uh, model system is beautiful yeah, because it is not only well ordered, but you really know where the atoms are. Yeah? So there's not only SDM, SDM is very important, but for instance, there, there are lead RV structural analysis that tell you exactly where the surface atoms are. Yeah? So this film is terminated by cobalt two plus ions in a tetrahedral environment. And also these co blue cobalt ions have three coordination partners, three oxygen um, atoms and oxygen is the second layer and then cobalt the third. So it's, you really know where the atom, atoms are. And uh, the other fascinating thing is uh, that this is not the only film. Yeah? So you can make other structures. Yeah? So this is another example, cobalt oxide, rock salt 100 structure. And again, it's a different termination, but we can again tell exactly where the atoms are. So it's uh, very well defined. And there are many other uh, systems that we can prepare. Yeah? And it's not only for cobalt oxide, uh, for, for many systems, uh, these stru structures have been uh, um, preparation 
um, recipes and structures uh, have been established in surface science. And now, um, yeah, uh, the idea would be to use this uh, knowledge, to use this knowledge uh, to uh, use them for application in, electro, um, in electrochemistry. You know, they have not been made for this purpose, uh, but there's a, there's a lot of work that has been invested there that we can use to better understand electrochemistry. Now, let me explain how such a system makes it uh, from this uh, very different vacuum environment into, um, into the solution. So this is the system that we, uh, that experimental system that we're using uh, to transfer uh, these model systems from the vacuum into uh, the uh, electrolyte or liquid environment. So this is the vacuum chamber where we prepare and characterize the sample, then it's moving down here into this uh, lock. Uh, in this lock, it's automatically sealed from the vacuum chamber. Then uh, you can fill this lock with ultra pure gases, for instance, argon. Uh, and then the sample is moving down here into this vessel uh, where you have ultra pure water and uh, that is purged with the ultra pure gas. And then the single crystal is disconnected from the sample holder. It uh, will drop into uh, the water. Uh, you can take it out. It's protected by the water and the atmosphere. You can take it out uh, and do electrochemical experiments with it. Yeah? And that's uh, our way of connecting these two worlds. So, um, to give you a better understanding, uh, what's the technology behind? So this is uh, this is the system that you saw. Yeah? So this is how it's built up. Yeah? So there's a there's a vacuum part. There's a there's a liquid part down here. You can move the sample. There's a lock, and then uh, the uh, single crystal uh, is clamped here and will be brought into will be disconnected and brought into the electrolyte. Now, and the 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 good thing with this approach is is that it's quite universal. Yeah? So uh, we use this preparation technique, for instance, uh, to do electrochemical infrared spectroscopy, uh, for mass spectrometry, uh, for cyclic voltammetry, for uh, electrochemical SDM. Um, so it's quite universal. Yeah? And um, that's the advantage. But of course, there are a few things to keep in mind. No? So it's, uh, there, it's, it's not that there are no problems. So one thing is uh, that during this transfer, uh, there are certain periods without potential control. Yeah? So you have to think about whether that plays a role or not. Of course, uh, there may be traces of contamination. Yeah? Even if you don't expose uh, the sample to the ambient, there may be traces of combination, uh, contamination. May maybe that this plays a role. Um, if you look at this uh, electrochemical institute characterization techniques, uh, they all have come with very different requirements regarding the sample size, quality, and so on. Yeah? So uh, you have to think about that, uh, how to connect these, um, yeah? especially for every technique. One very important thing is if you do this transfer, um, Normally in UHV, you have foreign materials, uh, sample holders that you definitely don't want to have in the electrolyte. You know? So that's why we use this technique where you only use the crystal and not the sample holder because you don't want the sample holder made of various materials to be in contact with the electrolyte. Now, when you're bringing uh, these uh, systems into an electrochemical environment, yeah, a hostile environment in terms of surface science, um, you should think about what you're doing. There. Yeah, so the first question should be, is this material, can I expect this material to be stable in the electrochemical environment? So the electrochemist would look at a Probeas stability diagram and make sure uh, that the experiment is run under conditions where you could expect um, thermodynamic uh, stability. So this is this diagram, stability of cobalt oxide as a function of the pH and the potential. And there's a certain region um, where cobalt oxide is stable right, in the alkaline region. Uh, so you, um, you should make sure, or it's good, it would be good to make sure that when you do this transfer, you're somewhere in the stability region. Yeah, and then maybe you can explore what happens if you're leaving that region. However, I want to make sure, or I want to point out that 
This is, of course, a bulk stability diagram. So it doesn't mean that there's no dissolubility um, in, an, uh, in, a, in the electrolyte. There will still be certain uh, solubility, so you may lose uh, ions. And of course, this structure diagram doesn't tell you anything about the surface structure. It's a bulk stability diagram. So uh, surface studies are urgently required. Now, but, uh, but in principle, this, uh, this approach works. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is what you can achieve. So this is, uh, this is as an example, this cobalt oxide film that we make in outer vacuum. And typically the surface scientist looks at the structure of such films by doing electron diffraction lead. Yeah? So in lead, you see a very characteristic, character, uh, characteristic diffraction pattern that tells you um, that the surface is ordered, uh, it's well defined, uh, you are happy, and then you bring it into this hostile environment of an uh, electrolyte. Yeah? And you can do experiments there. And if you do the message, if, if you do the experiments under the right conditions and then bring back the sample, you will still see the same lead pattern. Yeah? So you would, may say the lead pattern now is a little bit more fuzzy, diffuse. That is true. That's because the surface is hydroxylated and there are also uh, electrolytes left over on the surface, but the long range structure is the same. Now, so this surface, this, this film in principle survives this transfer and quite extended experiments uh, in the electrolyte. Now, um, when we, uh, now we know that we can do this uh, transfer. Now let's think a little bit about what kind of experiments we would like to do. Uh, and what kind of um, information we would like to have. No? So what is the type of information if this is a, wish, a Christmas wish list? Yeah, so what, what information would you wish to have on your system? So um, of course, uh, you would like to understand the geometric, uh, geometric structure, the local geometric structure. So typically you would apply microscopies to do so. If you are interested in the global changes of the geometric structure, diffraction techniques are very helpful. You would like to learn about the electronic structure and composition of the system. You would like to learn about the surface chemistry. And then finally, you would like to learn about the reactivity and kinetics. Yeah, and also for electrochemistry, the stability of the system is a very, very important aspect. Now, uh, if you would like to have this information uh, from a surface science experiment, what experiments uh, would, would you do? So I put the abbreviations here for the non-experts in surface science. I will explain briefly, but the message is there are all kinds of experiments out there that give you exactly this information. No? So microscopies are typical microscopies are scanning tunneling microscopy and atomic force microscopy. Diffraction technique, any surface scientist will, will use electron diffraction, low energy electron diffraction. If you have a synchrotron, you can also do a surface, well, mostly it's synchrotron, let's see. Uh, uh, you, uh, you can do surface X-ray diffraction, can also be done uh, in the lab, but better at the synchrotron. Um, for the electronic structure, uh, people do XPS mostly, Auger electron spectroscopy, um, valence band spectroscopy. Um, for the surface uh, chemistry, you would like to do infrared spectroscopy, XPS maybe, uh, or some frequency generation spectroscopy. Uh, for the reactivity, you would like uh, to do temperature programmed desorption or temper temperature programmed reaction. Um, if you have a molecular beam system, you can also use that and do advanced molecular beam experiments. Yeah, and for stability tests, you would use any of these techniques. So this, this, is, this is the huge V world, the surface science world. And now let's go to electrochemistry well and ask the same question. What experiments would you apply? Now, if you want to do a microscopy, um, you, you can do electrochemical scanning tunneling microscopy or electrochemical atomic force microscopy. If you want to do diffraction, you can do surface X-ray diffraction under electrochemical conditions, for instance. Uh, XPS, you can do electrochemical XPS. 
Surface chemistry, you can do electrochemical infrared or polarization modulation infrared under electrochemical conditions or uh, also some frequency generation spectroscopy. Um, for the reactivity, you would do probably CVs uh, or also you can do mass spectrometry, electrochemical mass spectrometry, uh, impedance spectroscopy, also mass spectromic spectrometric techniques that allow you to look specifically at the strip. So, I find that quite uh, fascinating. Yeah, look at this list of methods on the right side and on the right, on the left side. Yeah, so there's a strong correspondence of these methods. Yeah, so we have very similar methods available available in the surface science world and in the electrochemistry world. Yeah, so there's a certain equivalence of methods that would allow you to transfer spectroscopic and microscopic information from one world to the other. And now. Think about uh, what you could do if you would be able to look at exactly the same systems uh, with both type of methods. That would mean that you're now looking at the same well-defined model systems with the same method in both worlds, uh, in vacuum and with the, electrolyte, with the electrolyte around under potential control. And such experiments, I believe, could really help you to understand what is the role of the electrolyte, what is the role of the potential control. This is the idea, basically. So in the in a, in a, in a, in a second uh, part of this first part of my lecture, I will go through a couple of these methods in electrochemistry and discuss to what extent they can be applied to the model systems that we have in mind, no? to the model systems made in ultra vacuum on a single crystal surface. Yeah, and then uh, after the break, I will show some application examples and uh, show what, what we can achieve. Yeah, but let's, let's look at the methods uh, a little bit at the history and development of these methods in general. <clears throat> so to start with the, uh, with the microscopies, um, one, uh, important microscopy is scanning tunneling microscopy, and you get, can apply this microscopy under electrochemical conditions. So that's the schematical uh, uh, setup. So uh, the, the sample would serve as a working electrode, and then you have your three electrodes set up. And there's a fourth electrode, that's the tip. Uh, and uh, you immerse the tip into the electrolyte. And of course, there's, a, um, there's one issue. Uh, the tip uh, is also, you, you have to apply a potential to the tip. Yeah? So the tip is also an electrolyte and you will, uh, you will have currents uh, between the tip uh, and uh, the other electrodes. Yeah? So in order to minimize uh, these currents, these electrochemical currents, uh, the tip uh, is typically electrically isolated and you leave out only the very end of the tip. Yeah? So that's how this experiment is done. Um, the experiment is old, yeah? so uh, the experiment is more than 30 years old. Um, it's been shown more than 30 years ago that such experiments uh, are feasible in principle. And then after a very short time, um, it has been shown that you can really achieve atomic resolution uh, with this experiment under electrochemical conditions, which is beautiful. Yeah? And uh, yeah, um, in principle, it is uh, it is uh, yeah relatively straightforward to achieve atomic or molecular resolution with this um, with this type of experiment. Now, so you see example, for instance, of porphyrin molecules sitting on an electrode. Um, but uh, there's uh, there's one thing that you keep have to keep in mind with this experiment. Yeah, and that's that's this tip is also an electrode. So there's one very critical difference to the UHV experiment. In the UHV experiment, you would just choose a bias between, uh, the, um, between the sample and the tip. Yeah? We would choose the bias to, to, to yeah, tunnel into some states um, of the material. In an electrochemical experiment, uh, you cannot do that uh, because you're not free with the choice of the bias. You have, to you have to make sure that your tip is always um, held under a potential where it's stable. Now, if you just apply any potential to the, to the tip, 
uh, very likely you will change the tip. Yeah? You may dissolve the tip, change the tip, and so on. Yeah? So there's a very, that's a very critical difference to the UHV experiment. Yeah? You, you're not free with the choice of the bias. But still, the experiment works. Yeah? So this is an example of um, cobalt oxide um, islands that we looked at together with the group of Jeppe Lauritsen uh, in Aarhus. So they uh, have prepared or they have made a recipe to prepare these islands on a uh, gold surface. So these are this SDM in uh, ultra vacuum. And then you can bring this system into the electrolyte and do electrochemical SDM. Uh, it's more fuzzy and the quality is not so good, but it's doable. Uh, and then uh, you can look at these structures, yeah, and uh, there are different structures. I will show later in the second part that these uh, bilayers, double bilayers. Uh, you can uh, visualize them under electrochemical conditions. But again, you're not free with the choice of the bias. Now, so these are pictures here with different, uh, uh, with, with, um, with, we're not free with the choice of the bias. So these are, um, uh, these are, um, uh, images uh, taken uh, at different potentials. Yeah? And we have to make sure that the tip is always under potential where it's stable. So the bias changes and as a result here in these images, uh, the contrast changes. Yeah? And in these images here, the islands appear as depressions, uh, whereas in, uh, under this uh, different potential, the islands appear as uh, protrusions. And that's a consequence of the fact that we are not free to choose uh, any bias. bias. So it's, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge. Now, if you don't want to use the tunneling uh, experiment, what else can you do? Well, the alternative is to use atomic force microscopy. Yeah, and again, atomic force microscopy applied to, well, maybe, let, maybe let's start with this. So what is atomic force microscopy? So in atomic force uh, microscopy, you have a, tip uh, on the cantilever, and that is typically in this exper experiment, it's vibrating. And then you detect the detuning or phase shift of this uh, vibration uh, optically with a laser. Yeah? So that's how this experiment works. Um, uh, you detect this detuning when this tip comes into contact with the sample and feels the forces between, uh, between the, tip, the tip and the sample. So again, this is a very, very old experiment. Yeah, it uh, has been shown very short time by, after invention of the, um, of the atomic force microscopy that you can do this experiment also under electrochemical conditions. Yeah, it's uh, 30 years ago, exactly. And recently there's been a lot of progress in atomic force microscopy. So if you follow surface science a little bit, in the meantime, the quality of atomic force microscopy images is uh, often better than the quality of uh, scanning tunneling microscopy images. Yeah, that's, uh, however, mostly at low temperature with functionalized tips. So that's not what you use in electrochemistry. But there's also been a lot of progress in electrochemistry. Uh, so uh, for instance, what people uh, use here, what's commercially available, uh, available are um, are setups where you do uh, optical excitation of, of the cantilever. And if you do this uh, excitation optically instead of with a piezo, uh, this uh, experiment is much more stable in the electrochemical environment. And here are a few examples uh, from uh, Beatrice Valdan's uh, group, for instance, uh, copper 100 under um, uh, CO2 um, reduction uh, conditions. And here, this is a is the interface of a um, of a ionic liquid, um, uh, also, also with um, molecular resolution. Yeah, so uh, from from Andres and Atkin uh, group, and um, this shows that that uh, you can achieve a lot with this experiment. So um, as I said before. Um, the alternative, if you want to look at structure, if you don't want to do microscopy, you have to do um, diffraction. So in surface science, everybody does diffraction. So every, every surface scientist does a low energy electron diffraction to look at the structure of, of interfaces. <clears throat> so you cannot work easily with electrons in electrochemistry. So what, what you can do is uh, X-ray diffraction. And this is an example here of a surface x-ray diffraction experiment. 
um, in the group of Andreas Stierle at Desi. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and that is uh, combined with a rotating uh, disc electrode. No? So there is a single crystal here, it's rotating. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a meniscus formed uh, to the electrolyte, and then you can uh, reflect your um, uh, X-ray beam from this, uh, from this interface. And of course, the detector has, been, has to be synchronized uh, <clears throat> uh, with, this, um, uh, with, the, with the rotation. Uh, but with modern 2D defect detectors, this is all possible. Uh, and you can extract uh, structural information yeah, right under uh, reaction conditions. Yeah? So this is a very beautiful diffraction experiment uh, for suitable for such model systems. And there's also another um, fascinating experiment uh, I would like to draw your attention to. Um, uh, at least from the surface science side. Uh, so in the meantime, it's also possible to do um, X-ray diffraction at the interface uh, with high energy um, X-rays in transmission. No? So here, this electrochemical cell and a, a single crystal, and then the X high energy X-rays go right through um, this interface. And in such a uh, in such a experiment, it's actually possible to see the very interface. And for the surface scientists, this experiment is really fascinating because the diffraction pattern very much looks like a low energy electron diffraction pattern. So uh, yeah, uh, any surface scientist will be quite excited. Now, this is, uh, this is the structure. Next, uh, let's take the next step and look at the chemistry. So how would you look at the chemistry? So uh, vibrational spectroscopy is a very important uh, method to look at chemistry. Um, this is a picture of an electrochemical, electro uh, infrared spectroscopy system that we're using in our group. So how does it work? You use your model surface, exactly the model surfaces that I showed. You come in with your infrared beam through an um, infrared transparent window. And then there's a little gap of a, in the micrometer range uh, filled with electrolyte. Yeah, you go through this gap, reflect your beam at the surface and uh, yeah, you put your detector and measure how much of your infrared radiation has been absorbed. Uh, and this is a real electrochemical experiment where the sample serves as a working electrode. Now, again, this is a very old experiment. Yeah? So um, the, the, the first experiments along these lines go back exactly 40 years. Yeah? So, um, uh, 40 years ago has been shown that such experiments are feasible. And, re and within a few years, um, yeah, uh, this has become a very powerful technique uh, with very high sensitivity. Yeah, so uh, this example spectra uh, taken a uh, while ago at, at a single crystal surface, you can see CO other adsorbates with very high sensitivity. Um, there's one peculiarity to this experiment, which you have to keep in mind. Yeah? So all these spectra that you see here are different spectra. There's no way of taking an infrared spectra spectrum at an interface without doing it in form of a different spectrum. Yeah? So it's always different spectra. So what you do is you have a program via which you or you, you have you, you change your potential now, for instance in form of such a staircase or you go zigzag and then you take one potential as a reference and the other potential as your measurement yeah and then you take the difference between these two potentials there's an implication to that the implication is that already at the time when you're taking the difference there may be adsorbates on the surface yeah if this is the case then, of course, <clears throat> uh, if you lose these adsorbates, you will have a peak in one direction in the difference. If you, uh, if you accumulate adsorbates, you will have a peak in the other direction. Also, you can have positive and negative peaks. If you're unlucky, maybe the adsorbates are there all the time. Yeah? And then it gets difficult. Yeah? The question is whether you are able to see the adsorbates at all. If you're lucky, the position shifts with the potential, and then you see such an S-shaped uh, peak, uh, but there's no guarantee. It's a difficult, and it will be difficult 
to uh, quantify. <clears throat> so this is the main um, challenge with this method. If you say, I don't want to take this uh, reference uh, at a different potential, there's only um, one other thing that you can do or one other experiment that you can do. And then this is so-called polarization modulation of red spectroscopy experiment. And how to explain that, I have to go back actually to the transparency before. So uh, one thing uh, that is important here with the uh, infrared spectroscopy is that you can change the polarization. You can change the polarization uh, such that the electric field is parallel to the surface or that is perpendicular to the surface. Now, if you're working on a metal surface, um, you have no parallel electric field directly at the metal surface. That means uh, that uh, the species that are absorbed directly at the metal surface will not be visible in the p-polarized um, for the p-polarized light. So that's how you can differentiate between species that are in solution and in uh, the electrolyte. In uh, people, uh, in uh, oh, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I mixed that. I'm sorry. Uh, I should have said uh, S-polarized. Uh, so let me let me explain again. So uh, for the S-polarized light, uh, um, uh, there's there's no electric field. Um, there's no electric field at the surface. Now the electro the S-polarized field will be screened by the surface. Uh, so that's that means that for the S-polarized light, uh, uh, you will not have any uh, absorption for species that are absorbed on the surface. Whereas for the P-polarized light, um, uh, you can have absorption at the surface and in the electron. Uh, this is the so-called metal surface selection rule. And that's the way how to differentiate between species that are absorbed in the electrolyte and at the surface. No? So for p-polarized light, you see the species in solution and at the interface. And for s-polarized light, you see the species in solution only. Uh, sorry for, um, uh, uh, for the mistake a minute ago. So, um, that gives you one possibility to correct or to remove the signal from the electron. What you can do is a so-called polarization modulation infrared experiment. And this polarization modulation infrared experiment, what you do is you take polarized light and with a photoelastic modulator, you change the polariz polarization from S to P all the time, periodically at high frequency. Yeah, and then you can generate by means of a lock in amplifier, you can NF, uh, generate the different signal and uh, the sum signal. Yeah, and in the different signal, uh, if you do it the right way, uh, the signal from the, um, from the species in solution uh, will, will be compensated. Yeah, so you're left over with, uh, with the signal from the very surface only. Uh, and that is the trick here in polarization modulation infrared spectroscopy, how to get rid of the signal from the solution. Yeah? And in such an experiment, you do not have to take a reference at a different potential because the reference or the, 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 the reference uh, spectrum is taken internally in a way yeah? at the same potential. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is possible. This really works. This example here for the methanol oxidation. Uh, where you can spe see species here adsorbed on the surface. So methanol oxidation uh, leads to CO adsorbed on the surface. And here you see CO adsorbed on the surface during methanol oxidation taken by PM, uh, PM iris. But one thing that you can already see from these spectra is that typically uh, the drawback is that the signal noise ratio is worse as compared to uh, conventional infrared spectroscopy. Um, yeah, the infrared spectroscopy is fascinating, I think, because it allows you to do the same experiment in ultra vacuum and at electrolyte. And just as I said, say, said again, you can take the same sample, absorb the same molecule, and then take the spectrum in vacuum and in the presence of the electrolyte. Now, so this is an example for CO and platinum um, in the electrolyte and uh, in vacuum. And you can see the bridge bonded and on top CO. Yeah, and uh, with this transfer of model system, now you can do exactly the same thing for any model system that you can make in ultra vacuum. Yeah? So these are nanoparticles on the support here. Uh, the same system, and now uh, we look at CO adsorption here 
are in vacuum and on the support. Exactly the same spectroscopy, exactly the same system, both environments. Well, I, I have to disclose some, some issues with this experiment. Yeah, it's not as uh, it, it's not coming without uh, without issues. Um, nothing comes without issues. I think. No uh, new technique. I think. So um, one thing that you have to think about is the geometry that you're using for this experiment. So typically, as I said, there's the single crystal, the window, and that small gap between the single crystal and the window. Yeah, and this uh, small gap typically is in the order of micrometers. Uh, and now let's assume that you want to do a um, electrocatalytic reaction. Uh, so for instance, you want to oxidize CO, electro-oxidize CO. In such a reaction, you would always generate protons or consume OH. Uh, so in a, the reaction itself would change the pH, the conditions uh, um, under which you run the condition, uh, you run the reaction. Now, normally that is no problem because if you're doing electrochemistry, normally you have a buffer and the buffer makes sure that you're not changing the pH. However, in this experiment, it's different. Yeah, you have a very small gap. So the volume of the buffer is, is very small. Yeah, and also diffusion into this gap can be very slow. Yeah, and that means uh, that if you do all this reaction on a single crystal uh, on a single crystalline surface and you convert the whole monolayer, you may change uh, the pH a lot. Yeah, and you can do a calculation. So this is a, it's an example calculation. What would happen if you convert a monolayer of, uh, of CO uh, in a in a thin layer of, uh, of 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 buffer? Yeah, and uh, you can see here if 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 the layer thickness is thinner, let's say than a micrometer or so, um, the pH changes can be dramatic. Uh, they can be dramatic when you run the reaction, and you have to keep that in mind. Uh, and uh, you have to make sure that the buffer is strong enough or the gap is, is large enough that you can really keep the electrochemical conditions. Uh, and I come back to that point. Again. But let me just uh, advertise one new experiment here. So uh, I think this is a very powerful technique yeah, for surface chemistry. Uh, and uh, surface X-ray diffraction mentioned is also a very powerful te technique. So at the moment, we're trying to bring these two techniques together in a new setup. So that's a combined X-ray diffraction, infrared reflection absorption spectroscopy system that we're currently setting up uh, at DESI Nano, uh, at DESI together with Andreas Steele from DESI NanoLab. And the idea here is to do these two experiments at the same time in electrochemical environments. So you have your model system here. You come in with your X-ray beam, do a X-ray diffraction, surface X-ray diffraction experiment. And then at the same time, you do your infrared experiment. Of course, it's not so easy because you have to think about all the linemen and so on, but uh, we think it's possible. It's in process of being set up and the, the, the potential is I think huge because you can learn about the structure and the chemistry at the interface at the same time. So um, of course, the introduction of methods cannot be complete without uh, mentioning photoelectron spectroscopy. So if you would ask anybody from surface science, what is the most important technique uh, in surface science, um, it's probably uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So um, then of course the question would be how to, yeah, how to do a photoelectron spectroscopy experiment in an electrochemical environment. So there's been a recent uh, review here. This picture is from a recent review from, um, uh, uh, from uh, Axel Knup Gericke and uh, Robert Schlögel, uh, Schlögel's group. Um, and basically, there are various approaches. But th the thing is that most of these approaches are actually not suitable for uh, yeah, single crystal surfaces, uh, the type of model systems I showed. Yeah, so they're very powerful. Yeah, so this is an example where um, uh, people looked at uh, oxygen evolution on the iridium catalyst. So it's all based on membranes that divide the vacuum from the electrolyte. Yeah, but it's not suited. You cannot do this experiment on a single crystal. So if you want to really use a single crystal and do electrochemist, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy on electrochemical conditions, um, you have to use this dip and pull method. 
Yeah, so uh, this is this original uh, publication here illustrating how it works uh, from uh, the advanced light source, uh, Berkeley. Uh, so what you do is you dip your sample into the electrolyte, pull it out, and then hope that there's a small film of electrolyte on the surface in which you can put control the potential. Um, yeah, this is a beautiful experiment yeah, because it allows you to do the spectroscopy on any surface. Yes, it's a beautiful experiment and many groups uh, are implementing or have been implementing that in the meantime. Um, but also there are things to keep in mind. No? So I showed you before, it's a problem if you have these very thin electrolyte films already, if they, are, they, are, they only have uh, thicknesses in the order of a micrometer with the infrared spectroscopy, it's difficult to control the pH. Here in this technology, you need films that are as thin as 10 to 20 nanometers. Yeah, so if you run chemical reactions in there, you really have to be extremely careful what you do. Yeah? So really have to work hard to know what your electrochemical conditions are in this experiment. Yeah? But still, it's a beautiful experiment. If you want to know what your electrochemical conditions are, um, the only if you want to do conventional electrochemical experiments, the only way is to couple really ex situ via a transfer system. Uh, so typically what people do is they, uh, they, uh, they use the electrochemical cells. So this is something we set up at the synchrotron Electra here, an electrochemical cell and attach it to the vacuum system. Yeah, and uh, how does it work? You have the electrochemical cell, you bring your single crystal in contact with the electrolyte to the electrochemistry. And then what we use is what we call a sample shower to wash the sample and then the sample is brought, brought back to the electrochemical environment. So this is a little video showing how the um, electrolyte makes contact, how the contact is broken, and then you come with your sample shower and wash your sample and hope that everything is okay, uh, and then you do the experiment. Of course, um, yeah, there's still issues. Yeah, so there are, there are points where you have to break uh, the contact where there's no potential control. Um, you have to think about that, but uh, you can do some reasonable experiments. I will show one or two. Later. So the final thing that I would briefly mention, uh, two or three minutes before the break, is the detection of products. So how do we detect products in electrochemistry? Um, so what you can do is, of course, mass spectrometry. Uh, electrochemical, there are various ways of doing electrochemical mass spectrometry. And the conventional way uh, is doing this uh, DEMS experiment. So that's from a review uh, of the Baltoshat group. Uh, so you have, a, um, uh, you have a water or a hydrophobic membrane, and then you can put the electrocatalyst on this membrane. And this is very efficient. Uh, the products here in the electrolyte may uh, evaporate into the gas phase here, and in the vacuum, you can detect them by mass spectrometer. Very efficient, very successful experiment. However, this type of experiment is not compatible with a single crystal that you make in ultra vacuum. Yeah? So if you want to do that, uh, you can uh, uh, do this uh, so-called OLEMS experiment that has been introduced by um, Mark Kopas group. Uh, so here, what you do is you use a single crystal and then you come with a capillary uh, that has this membrane built in from the bottom side and bring it in close contact uh, to the single crystal. Yeah? So this really works with the single crystal. I also want to make a little uh, advertisement here, if this is allowed. So what we're using at the moment are microfluidic um, inlets for mass spectrometry that you can uh, also get uh, uh, obtained commercially uh, from a company here, um, uh, Spectra Inlets, uh, uh, that has been funded by Korkendorf and Peter Westborg. And uh, this is basically a hydrophobic, hydrophobic chip. Um, that uh, that that contains this uh, this 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 uh, this, this uh, membrane you now with very small pores, and this is a very 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 uh, sensitive tool uh, to do mass spectrometry, and it's compatible with the single crystals. Yeah, and the last uh, slide, this last mass spectrometry I want to mention is mass spectrometry that allows you to detect stability of single crystals. Uh, so uh, what we're using here uh, together uh, of yeah, uh, the instrument uh, developed and, and um, um, run by the group of Karl Meyerhofer. Um, 
at the Helmholtz Institute in, in Erlang, they developed this uh, scanning flow cell um, inductive, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, uh, where you have a flow of electrolyte and you detect with a uh, ICPMS uh, the composition of the electrolyte, and then you can bring in contact this cell with a with a model surface, as I explained or as I showed. Uh, and in this experiment, you can measure dissolution rate, and it's really unbelievable how sensitive this experiment is. Yeah, so you can. Uh, you can, uh, we, we looked, for instance, at cobalt oxide surfaces, and you can detect dissolution rates that are in the order of 10% of a monolayer per hour. Now, so really surface science sensitivity. Uh, if something changes at the surface science level, you can see that. Yeah? So uh, unbelievable uh, uh, sensitivity. So uh, with this, I'm at the end of the first part. It's gone it's a bit longer um, than I expected, as usual, probably. But um, let me again make uh, stress the, the the fascinating point. So I believe that there there are a number of experiments around there in surface science that give you all the information that you uh, need. And on the other on the other hand, there are very similar experiments out there in electrochemistry that give you have the same information. Uh, and there's very much of a correspondence between the worlds. Um, yeah, and now uh, the question is, uh, can we look at the same systems and apply the same methods? And if we can do so, I think we can learn a lot about the role of the electrolyte and about the role um, of the potential applied. Uh, with this, I um, would like to stop here. Um, yeah, and I, Happy to take questions to the first part. Thank you so much, Jörg. It was a really great introduction in all of those techniques. Uh, well, I, I hope so the audience can ask questions. Uh, feel free to either raise your hand or you know, write in, your, in, in the chat or wherever you prefer, or simply just directly ask questions. So we have about five to 10 minutes for it. Maybe then I can start. Um, I'm curious in general, the biggest issue is the, um, the surfaces decontamination by the carbon residuals or CO2, CO. So whenever you have that transfer happening, how, how much carbon do you really see after that, after the electrochemical experiment in say XPS or UPS? And how, how to get rid of it? Or is there any, maybe some tricks that you found to be useful? Yeah, I think this is a very important question, and it's, uh, I think, also the biggest challenge. I think the answer is, um, it depends very much on the system that you're looking at. Yeah? So uh, if you have, for instance, a very reactive, clean, and uh, noble metal platinum surface in mind, this is a big problem. Yeah? So um, car on that surface, everything will absorb, and many molecules will spontaneously decompose. Of course, you can, uh, you can try to do something to deactivate the surface in a controlled way. Uh, for instance, you could put adsorbates that adsorbs sufficiently strong, uh, simple would be CO, to protect the surface a little bit while you're doing this transfer. Um, if you're looking at other surfaces, the problem may be not as severe. Yeah, so um, it depends very much. So we are looking, for instance, at oxi oxide surfaces a lot. Oxides can be very tricky. Yeah? So Ulrike Diebold's group have shown that um, that very big problems if you bring, if you if you're working with oxide and the, the environment is, is not perfectly clean, you have traces of um, uh, carbonic uh, acids in the environment and you absorb them on the surface. Uh, yeah, you find that. Um, it depends very much on the conditions. Yeah, so uh, you can also uh, you can also be lucky. Yeah, so uh, for the cobalt oxide, for instance, uh, we have the advantage that we're working on the alkaline conditions. And in these conditions, uh, these carbonic acids, they don't absorb strongly. Yeah, so under these conditions, you don't have to deal with this uh, problem so much. Yeah, so uh, the message is really, of course, you should try as hard as possible. Um, but contaminations are always a problem. Yeah, it's a problem in any kind of transfer and in, um, not only in electrochemistry, but also in principle with all kinds of 
high pressure experiments in, in, in catalysis. So people trying to do a near ambient pressure spectroscopies and methods. Yeah, if you go to ambient pressure and have PPM contamination, you, you can have monolayers easily. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an intrinsic problem. And that's also people sometimes forget. That's the reason why surface science experiments were done in outer vacuum in the first place. Yeah, so of course the outer vacuum is somehow a um, uh, yeah, uh, non-realistic environment, but there's a reason that we use it uh, to avoid this problem. Uh, and I think we have to monitor it and tell uh, whether this plays a role um, and see whether we can control it or understand what it does. Okay, okay, that, that's that's great to know. So um, one question that comes from the chat is whether um, the um, whether you put the sample directly into the electrolyte or you put it in some sort of a transfer liquid, say ultra pure water, and then you put it in the electrochemical cell. Um, yeah, well, it's also a very good question. Yeah, so of course, we, we were thinking and discussing and trying everything in the beginning. So in uh, there's no general rule. Um, but what we mostly do now is actually we um, mostly use uh, the transfer into ultra pure water. Uh, because in ultra pure water, you have very little chemistry. Yeah, so if you the problem is if you if you do not control the potential and bring the sample into an electrolyte, you immediately have electrochemistry going on and you uh, also have a backside of the sample and sides of the sample and you cannot uh, control what is going on there. And the, to our experience, the best uh, method if you want to keep the sample mostly in the state that you have prepared it is to uh, do the transfer into ultra pure water uh, to protect the surface and then uh, transfer, for instance, into uh, some electrochemical um, experiment. And once you make the contact there, immediately have the potential control. Uh, so if you transfer, for instance, into a cell where you do infrared spectroscopy, uh, as soon as you contact the electrolyte, uh, you want to have the potential control. So that's what we mostly do. Right. So that, okay. But on the way back, I'm curious what actually happens because my understanding was that you have to dry the sample actually. In fact, yes. Whenever you dry, yeah. even any PPB levels of contamination will just perfect. Come perfect question. Yeah, the way back is a challenge. Is, is an even greater challenge. Yeah. So the way, uh, the one way is um, is tricky, but the way back is certainly very very tricky because on the way back, there's no way uh, of not breaking uh, the potential control uh, without having um, without having electrolytes there. No? So at the point where you would take it out, you break the potential control and the electrolyte is still there. And then you only can hope for the best. Yeah, And uh, yeah, that, that depends very much. Yeah? So I, I think if you want to, if you want to uh, detect an unstable adsorbate monolayer on the surface, that would be very difficult with such an experiment. Um, so because you would immediately have chemistry. Uh, if you're just interested, for instance, in the stability of nanoparticles, yeah, the, the situation will be very different. Yeah? So you will not easily spontaneously dissolve the nanoparticles when you take, it, uh, when you take out the sample. Uh, so again, uh, I think this is uh, tricky. Uh, in these experiments, actually, we, we, we took the sample out and um, yeah, uh, the lead pattern that you see, for, for instance, for the cobalt uh, oxide is the lead pattern where we do know post annealing. Yeah? So the, the system is as it was in the electrolyte and it's just dried. Yeah? Of course, it's, it's probably a lot of uh, electrolyte left over on the surface. Um, yeah, but that's, uh, that's, that's what you can do. Okay, any questions? Um, I hope somebody from the audience will be able to ask directly. So please go ahead. Okay, maybe the last one before we continue. Maybe you can comment a little bit um, on the possibility of doing STS, so scanning, tunneling, spectroscopy in liquids. Um, there are very, very few attempts as far as I know. Maybe the field has advanced, I'm not sure, but um, I'm sure you can probably give some uh, of your understanding of how feasible it is. Um, 
Um, yeah, it's probably, I, I give the same answer every time uh, you ask me that again, I think that again, depends very much on the system that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to, I mean, we are, we also have, let's say, limited um, experience with uh, electrochemical SDM. Uh, we, we're using it for a few years now. Um, on these complex surfaces, uh, I think the, <clears throat> the problem is uh, that the potential, the, the potential control on the, on the tip. Yeah? So uh, you, you cannot just uh, play with the potential uh, on the tip as you like. Uh, the degree to what you can do that depends very much on the conditions. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, for instance, for the yeah, most people use uh, tungsten tips uh, because that's easiest. Yeah. But tungsten is not very stable. So there are many examples where it has been seen that there's dissolution from the tungsten tips, and then you make structures on the surface that are actually. Um, dissolved tungsten or derived from dissolved tungsten on the surface. And that happens very easy. Yeah, so and if you change the potential now by doing um, SDS, yeah, this is, um, uh, this is, this is a big problem. Um, you, you can use platinum iridium tips, which are more stable. Yeah, preparation of these tips is not so easy. Yeah, so uh, we, we managed to do it a lot of some exp successful experiments now. Uh, with these tips, but it's it's way it's way more tricky. Um, there, yeah, you have better chances. Um, yeah, and then of course is the question how stable is your system? Yeah. So, but again, I mean, the main challenge is that the the tip is an is an electrode. Yeah, and in the in the vacuum, the tip is not an electrode. Yeah, and I think there's um, you cannot compare really uh, the versatility of SDS. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can continue and then uh, we'll have the rest of the questions at the end. So should we continue right ahead? Yes, you can keep going, yep, thank you. Okay, so um, then I will continue with the second part of the presentation and in the second part, that's gonna be shorter, I will give you some application examples. Um, yeah, illustrating what you can learn with this approach that I just showed. Yeah, and as I said in the in the first part, these application examples come from four fields. We're gonna look at well-defined oxide surfaces, on catalyst nanoparticles, on supports, mainly oxide supports, on ionic liquids as uh, catalytic modifiers, and on functional organic films on oxide index. Yeah, so these are all systems where it's very difficult to prepare them. Uh, well, wait, let's say where it's essential to look at the systems um, or understand the system in outer vacuum yeah, and then look at the electrochemical behavior because it's extremely helpful to understand the interfaces from a surface science perspective in the first place. So let's start with this well-defined oxide interface. So what's the challenge? So what you see here are two examples of oxide surfaces in electrochemistry. So ruthenium titanium dioxide electrocatalyst for oxygen evolution. Um, that's work from, um, uh, from Karl Mayer of group, um, Sergei Shirevko, um, and uh, co-authors. And what you see here is a complex, um, complex material. Um, yeah, um, and we need, to understand it somehow. Um, the other example that you see here is the cobalt oxide uh, based nanomaterial, cobalt oxide nanoparticles on a, uh, on a, on a carbon support, again, a complex uh, nanostructured surface. So what is, what is the issue? So first of all, as you can see, these surfaces are not simple. Yeah? So they expose, um, very different structures to the electrolyte. Um, and we have to understand what these structures are. Yeah, so very often the surface structure under reaction condition is not understood. Yeah, so we would need to know where the atoms are in any of these structures that we see there. There's one thing on top with oxides. 
So oxides very often show a very pronounced structure dependence. And so in sharp contrast to metal surfaces or many semiconductors, the reactivity of oxide surface is completely different, whether you look at one facet or not. I will show an example. And so uh, there's no way of round, uh, around really knowing uh, what the structure is um, uh, for the particular uh, system that you look at. Uh, so that's, that's a very big difference to, to other systems. Yeah, and then finally, also something that you see in this picture, uh, there's typically very strong structural dynamics. You, you operate the systems and after operation, they look completely different. Yeah, so the structure, the surface structure, but also the bulk structure changes under operation conditions. Yeah, and we need to understand that. Otherwise, there's no chance uh, to understand what's going on there. So I, I, show, I talked about this structure dependence. I want to show you one thing, which I find totally stuck. Yeah, so this is a comparison. This is a surface science experiment. This is a surface science experiment that compares water absorption on two cobalt oxide surfaces. It's the two cobalt oxide surfaces that I talked about before. It's this cobalt oxide CO3 or 4111 surface and the rock salt cobalt oxide 100 surface. And remember, both surfaces are terminated by cobalt 2 plus ions and oxygen 2 minus ions. And the only thing that is different at the surface is the coordination environment of the ions. Well, of course, this, there's also different oxidation state for the cobalt. Yeah, but at the surface, uh, this, is, this is the difference. Yeah, the, the, the structure of uh, the very structure of the surface, the coordination environment of the ions. Now let's look at the interaction of water. Now, so we absorb water in ultra vacuum environment. At room temperature, we look at the infrared spectrum exposed to water, nothing happens. There's virtually no interaction with water at all. Water very weakly interacts with the surface. We can go to low temperature and then we can condense ice, multi-layer or ice clusters on the surface. Uh, that's molecular water very weakly interacting with the surface. So in essence, this surface is totally inert. It doesn't like water. There's no dissociation, very weak interaction, super inert. Now we take this surface that is terminated by the same ions. Now we so expose it to a little bit of water and hell breaks loose. Uh, so a little bit of water makes OH groups on the surface. Immediately the water dissociates. Then we put more water and we get a very complex infrared spectrum. All kinds of well-defined structures assemble on the surface. And we have shown that these structures consists of OH groups, dissociated water molecules and molecular waters assembled in, in a certain way. Uh, so very strong interaction. Yeah? And these species stay there up to high temperature. So the message is extreme structure dependence. Uh, so the interaction with water depends a lot on the, on the surface structure. Of course, you would like to understand now what are the structures that are being formed. And there, we really can gain from the fact that in our model systems, we really know where the atoms are. Yeah? So we can talk to theoreticians and tell them we have a surface and we know where the atoms are. Please model this surface and tell, you, tell us what you think that water does on that surface. And we did that with, together with a group of uh, Philippe Sauté, George Jan did the calculations here. And he calculated a lot of structures on the cobalt oxide surface and calculated vibrational fingerprints of the structure structures. And then you can compare with infrared spectroscopy and see whether you can identify some of these structures on the surface. I want to discuss, I don't want to discuss this uh, spectra in detail, but I want to show you one particular motive uh, that you can identify, which I personally find totally yeah, fascinating. Yeah. It is this motif that you can identify. This is a cobalt ion that sits on the surface and we call it half solvated cobalt two plus surface ion because uh, it is the cobalt surface ion that's surrounded by three oxygen ions from the oxide lattice on the one side and three water molecules on the other side. No? So it's the cobalt ion that is at the very interface between the water and the oxide. And you can identify 
uh, the fingerprint of these species in the vibration spectrum. Uh, and in order to do so, you have to know what the structure is. Now, uh, you can make these structures, and of course, you want to see what they do in the electrochemical environment. And I showed you this electrochemical SCM experiment. And now uh, we, we use this electrochemical SDM to show, to, to check what these cobalt ions do uh, when we leave the stability region and bring them to a state where they should not be stable. They would just dissolve or do they something else. So uh, we start here from a higher potential and decrease the potential up to a, the point where we expect um, a reduction of uh, cobalt three plus uh, around this region and then further into region where we uh, make metallic cobalt. Yeah, and then we follow what, 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 what is happening. Yeah, and here you see SDM images, uh, a series of SDM images. And you see this double bilayers, the white features here. And this, uh, this darker features are the bilayer islands. Um, as a function of time, yeah? And of course, you, had, you don't have atomic resolution in this picture, it's very difficult, uh, but you see that the structure is stable. Yeah? And now we lower the potential and see what happens. And you see that this double bilayers, they are stable, but this uh, bilayer islands, yeah, they, they seem to move um, as a function of time. Yeah? So they really move over the surface in this region. Yeah? So apparently uh, cobalt becomes um, mobile desorbs, reabsorbs, and then the, the, the ions really change their structure on the surface dynamically. So we get a very dynamic surface. And then we, if you further decrease the potential, um, these islands dissolve, yeah, and at the same time, they really move over the surface. Yeah, very dynamic situation. These double bilayer islands are still there. And if you further decrease the potential, we actually have redeposition. Um, of, of this uh, double bilayer islands. So we have more of these islands. We again reabsorb cobalt on the surface. And finally, if you're going to very negative potentials, we reduce um, the cobalt to metallic cobalt. Yeah, so we get a good feeling how mobile the structures are. And now uh, we can try to correlate this mobility, this structural stability to the dissolution behavior. Uh, so we do under the same conditions, we do um, uh, scanning a flow cell, um, uh, uh, um, um, mass spectrometry experiment and measure the dissolution rate when we go from the stability region to different potentials where the cobalt oxide ion should be. Yeah, what you see is if you jump into this uh, region where you see this onset of mobilities, where these uh, islands start to move, yeah, then you get a strong transient dissolution. Uh, so we get dissolution is a blue curve here uh, for a short time, for a certain time. If you jump to a potential where you uh, that is beyond, where you get again have reabsorption of this cobalt oxide, you can you can avoid this dissolution. Yeah, so you don't have the solution uh, of cobalt oxide anymore. Uh, you only have it as a transient process if you jump into this mobility region. Yeah, so this is the information that you get. Very important information on the stability of the systems. Uh, so you can also do that with these thick cobalt oxide layers. Um, I showed you that you can make these uh, films, then bring them into an electrolyte and bring them back and show that they are still there. Now, of course, the question is, does the, do these systems dissolve to some extent? Yeah, and you can measure that with this um, micro, with this uh, mass spectrometry experiment. So we have done that with a different pH as a function of the potential. And the message here, so this, you always measure the, the, the currents together with the dissolution rates. And the message from this experiment is that if you stay within the right potential window and uh, choose the right pH, the dissolution rate is actually below the detection limit of this experiment. And I mentioned at the beginning, the detection uh, limit of this experiment is quite impressive. Uh, it's somewhere in the, in the range of percent monolayer uh, per hour. So we really have practically no dissolution of this film under 
um, the conditions of the experiment. So the next step is uh, to look at um, metal particles. Yeah, so we make we put metal particles on uh, such an oxide um, to look at the electronic and electrocatalytic behavior. Why is that interesting? So this is an example of a material that combines uh, such an oxide phase uh, with a normal metal. In this case, it's actually platinum stabilized uh, by cerium oxide on a carbon support. And you can use this material as a uh, as an anode material in the fuel cell. Uh, so this is a material that actually shows quite good performance in the fuel cell. And if you, because it contains very little uh, platinum, also, also the, the platinum efficiency is very good. And what we have shown uh, previously in, in, uh, in older work is uh, quite interestingly, what happens is that you, that you will anchor this platinum species in form of ionic species on this cobalt oxide, uh, on this uh, serum oxide, I'm sorry, if you go to oxidizing conditions. And then if you reduce the system, you will reduce the platinum. The platinum will make small um, yeah, metallic nanoparticles. These are catalytically active, yeah, but you can keep these particles from, um, from dissolving if you're going to high potential because you can redisperse the platinum and anchor the platinum on this cobalt oxide. Yeah? So the cobalt, uh, 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 I'm saying cobalt oxide, serum oxide, on the serum oxide. Now, so the serum oxide um, is, um, uh, has the functionality of stabilizing the platinum um, under, yeah, uh, under conditions where you change uh, the potential. Uh, so it's a, it's a, the idea is to stabilize the noble metal. And of course, you could also modify the reactivity. Of the noble metal. Now, in order to explore that, now you can build a model system. Yeah, and for your mo model systems, I show example here where we can look at the, uh, at the cobalt oxide film that I mentioned before. It's very, yeah, in some respect, it's similar to the serum oxide uh, film. So we can make this cobalt oxide film. We can deposit small platinum nanoparticles on it, small aggregates or larger aggregates. Yeah, and the fascinating thing here is that by this surface science technique, you can control the size and you can make aggregates that are as small as just a few atoms, just five, six atoms in size in average. Yeah? So extremely small aggregates, or if you like, you can all make, also make bigger aggregates. Yeah? So these aggregates here have around 300 atoms. They just have five or six atoms. Yeah? So what is the difference in electronic structure? What is the difference in stability? What is the difference in reactivity? Now, of course, again, at that point, very importantly, you can talk to theoreticians because you can tell them what the structure is of your system. And so this is work ongoing by um, Simone Pekinin, uh, Matteo uh, Farnese uh, is doing the calculation in Simone Pekinin's group uh, and uh, Stefano Fabri, with Stefano Fabri's um, in Trieste. Uh, and uh, they calculated a lot of uh, structures um, for platinum deposits on cobalt oxide. And I don't want to discuss all the details in uh, here, but I just want to point out two things that are important. So one thing that you learn is if you have platinum atoms that are in direct contact with the cobalt oxide, the electronic structure changes. Typically you have partial oxidation of the platinum. We call that an electronic metal support interaction. If you have larger particles, the platinum in the second and third layer is already something like metallic platinum, you know, platinum zero. Uh, so that's electronically different. You can also find platinum four species and you can make them either by stabilizing the platinum four by OH or water ligands. That's very similar to the species I showed before with the cobalt. Or you can make this platinum four by embedding the platinum in the lattice. Yeah, and if you embed the platinum in the lattice, you will eject some cobalt ions from the lattice. I come back to that in a minute. Yeah, and now of course you can look at the systems under surface science conditions and do photoelectron spectroscopy to learn about their electronic structure. 
And indeed, what you see here with um, yeah, smaller, uh, very small particles, larger and large particles, is that you really have these species that I showed in the last transparency. And also, you have this platinum four species. Yeah, we believe that they are stabilized by water on the surface. You have these partially oxidized platinum species in contact, direct contact with the cobalt oxide. And if you make bigger particles, you have these platinum. And you can uh, look at what, what's happening when you anneal the system. And then you make really a lot of this platinum four. And we think this is really this exchange mechanism where you embed platinum in the lattice. Um, cobalt is popping out uh, from the surface and uh, you, 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 you uh, anchor the platinum species uh, on the cobalt, uh, on, the, on the oxides. Now, I showed you this electrochemical uh, immersion, immersion experiment before, um, and you can use this experiment to follow the oxidation of the platinum particles for this particular model system. So this is exactly um, uh, this system um, after treatment, in an electrochemical cell at different potentials. Yeah, and this shows that this experiment really works. You can follow the oxidation of the platinum particles as a function of the potential in the electrochemical cell after transfer back to the ultra vacuum and the beam. Also, we see this platinum delta plus and platinum zero species in larger particles and at potential 1.3 volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode, we really see oxidation, surface oxidation of the spectrum particles. That's expected. And for the small particles, the electronic structure, as I explained, is different. We see this partially oxidized platinum species only, yeah, along with some platinum 4 plus species um, uh, in the system. So uh, now let's look uh, at, the, uh, at the chemistry on the surfaces. So uh, you can do C oxidation, simple stress fraction, then C oxidation on the platinum 111 surface at pH 10 here. And if you do the same experiment on these uh, model surfaces, uh, you see that the uh, uh, cyclobotomograms look very different. So this pre-peak um, at low potential is much stronger. Yeah, and that tells you that there's a lot of oxidation without, um, yeah, uh, without uh, poisoning of the surface, surface by CO. Yeah, and that's uh, mainly because you now on such a uh, surface that has small nanoparticles, you can provide OH groups to react with the CO um, via the interface and via the support. Yeah, and that allows you to do the C oxidation already under conditions where the surface is poisoned on a single crystal surface. Now, finally, let's look at the stability of the system. And this is really surprising. Yeah, so we do this scanning flow cell, ICP mass spectrometry experiment to see how stable the system is. And we did this experiment with cobalt oxide. And here you see that cobalt oxide really doesn't dissolve if you ramp up and down the potential. If you use uh, these big nanoparticles, ramp up and ramp down the potential, there's dissolution of platinum. That's expected. Now, if you reduce the platinum particles, part of it dissolves, that is, uh, is expected. But the surprise is uh, when you're doing this experiment with these very small particles, what you see is actually very little dissolution of the platinum, but instead cobalt dissolves. So how can you explain that? So what, what is happening here is we believe that you actually have this exchange process where platinum is embedded into the oxide support, cobalt is ejected and this ejected cobalt uh, is then uh, easily dissolved um, in this experiment. Yeah, so this is our potential explanation. So the second example that I would like to show uh, is something to totally is fascinating. Yeah, this is really, I think, totally fascinating. Is uh, ionic liquid as catalytic modifiers in electrochemistry? Something really. Uh, what is the idea behind? Uh, so, um, yeah, I think most of you know what an ionic liquid is. Ionic liquid is a is a salt that is basically liquid at low temperatures. So many ionic liquids are liquid at room, room temperatures, room temperature and below. And you can use them as an electrolyte. Um, 
And uh, also many of these ionic liquids, uh, which are basically large organic cations and anions, uh, also uh, provide very high electrochemical stability. Uh, so they don't decompose under reaction conditions, under electrochemical reaction conditions, at least if you're using the, the right ones. Uh, so it's very, they're, they're very stable um, electrolytes. And fascinatingly, um, there are billions and billions of combinations. Yeah, so you can, uh, if you want to use them as electrolyte or as a modifier, you have billions of compounds that you can choose from to modify, for instance, your reaction environment. Yeah, and this is a concept that has been very successfully implemented in heterogeneous catalysis. So they are actually commercial, um, so-called skill catalysts, solid catalysts with ionic liquid layers around, which use this concept. So basically what the people do is they use a conventional supported catalyst, a normal metal on a support, coat it with the ionic liquid, and then they hope that the ionic liquid would modify the reactivity of the system, uh, and particularly the selectivity. Yeah, and uh, it could do so, for instance, by blocking specific sites, uh, by interacting with the reactants, by um, by, by having ligand effects, sort of, by electronic effects. Yeah, so you can think of all kinds of explanations uh, why the ionic liquid could modify the reactivity. Actually, it's, it's extremely successful. Yeah, so there's, uh, even, um, uh, there's even an industrial process uh, implemented um, by Clariant um, in the meantime, uh, where such a catalyst is used at the, uh, at the industrial scale. Yeah, and if you know, uh, if you have a background a little bit in heterogeneous catalysts, you know how rare that is, that, is a, that a large scale industrial process um, is changed, uh, uh, where the, in a large scale industrial process, the catalyst material is changed. Uh, this is really rare. Yeah? And here you have such an example. So it's extremely successful um, approach. Well, um, the question is, can we use the same idea in electrochemistry? Can we use these ILs as modifiers uh, for electrochemistry? Yeah, and uh, uh, we want to look at that uh, using a test reaction. Yeah, and our test reaction is something, again, very simple. It's the selective oxidation of a secondary alcohol. So the simplest example would be the oxidation of, acid, uh, of uh, isopropanol to acid. Uh, and actually, this is not a useless uh, uh, reaction. It's actually a very useful experiment uh, uh, reaction because this couple, this, this, these two reactants uh, or this reaction can be used in a fuel cell. And if you do so, um, the acetone here is a hydrogen carrier. Yeah, that can be rehydrogenated and then it can go in cycle. So it can you be used as a hydrogen, um, yeah, well, transport and storage. Um, method to uh, convert chemically bound hydrogen back to electricity, very useful. Now we're looking at this related reaction that can be used in the same way, yeah? but uh, it's, it's also interested from a, interesting from another point of view. It's the oxidation of 2,3-butan diol. Yeah? So we have two uh, secondary alcohols that can be oxidized. You make the acetine first, yeah? one, carbonyl group or the diacetyl with two carbon. And now the question is, can we control that reaction by, um, by an ionic liquid? Yeah, and the ionic liquid that we're using is this one that you see here, is the C1, C2, immediate sodium OTF, a very simple one. And we can understand how it interacts with the metal surface. Yeah, we bring it, we absorb it on the metal surface and do a surface science experiment in which we do infrared spectroscopy in order to understand what the interaction is. Yeah? And here we grow this layer. These are spectra taken while we grow this layer. And in this layer, we can identify specific peaks that tell us that in particular, in particular uh, this OTF ion adsorbs on the metal surface via this SO2, SO3. Yeah? So this is uh, the thing that really sticks to the surface. That's, of course, under surface kinds conditions. Now, what would happen under electrochemical conditions? 
Now we can do the same infrared spectroscopy experiment under electrochemical conditions. Yes? Take a metal surface, absorb the ionic liquid as a function of the potential. We can identify all these bands by changing the polarization. I explained that before. We can tell that we can really see species that are absorbed on the surface. And then we can identify the species and we can tell this is a function of the potential also under electrical, uh, uh, electrochemical conditions, these OTF ions will absorb on the surface and desorb from the surface if we ramp up the potential and if we um, to positive values and ramp down to negative values. Yeah? So we can selectively block part of the surface by this ionic. And now we can use that in uh, for our electrocatalytic reaction. We go to the selective oxidation of the butan diol to the acetoin and diacetyl and uh, do infrared spectroscopy. And infrared spectroscopy allows us to identify the reactants and all the products. Uh, so the spectra are complex, but you can find one band that is characteristic for the two products here. Um, so this is the carbonyl band that is characteristic for both acetoin and diacetyl. And you can find one band that is characteristic for the intermediate here for the uh, acetyl. Uh, and then you can follow the reaction quantitatively. And you see that initially there's a reaction to acetoin. And then at higher potential, we further oxidize the acetoin to uh, di diacetyl. Now, now we do exactly the same thing in the presence of the ionic now, so we follow the same two bands, uh, and now we see something completely different. We see that we make the acetoin, but then the reaction stops. Now, so we selectively ox oxidize to the acetoin, <clears throat> but the second reaction, the full oxidation to the diacetyl stops. So why is that? We believe that it, this is the effect of this ionic liquid of the OTF anion. So in order to oxidize the um, acetoin, you will need OH group on the groups on the surface. And we know that um, at the potential region where the second reaction happens, um, the OTF adsorbs on the surface and replaces the OH groups. Yeah? So the second reaction is blocked because we stop it by uh, removing the OH from the surface um, through adsorption of this catalytic model. So uh, last uh, four minutes of the presentation, um, I would very briefly touch one uh, more aspects, aspect, and that is related uh, more to material science. So functional organic films on oxides. So um, functional organic films on oxides, you can find in many applications. Yeah, so, for instance, in electronic applications, you make uh, you can make um, field effect transistors. This is work from um, Markus Halik's group. Um, uh, you can make dye-sensitized solar cells, but you can also make uh, catalytic materials. You can make sensors, biointerfaces, smart materials. Many of these applications are related to electrochemistry, either in the preparation of the material or in the operation use of. So can we use this model approach to understand these interfaces? Yeah, what we can do is we can make these interfaces in ultra vacuum and understand how these molecules bind to the surface. And this is a first step here in this direction. We, we take a test molecule, the phenyl phosphonic acid, and this molecule carries these phosphonic acid groups. And that's a very strong um, anchor unit that allows you to attach a molecule to an oxide surface. Yeah, but it's not, uh, it's not really understood uh, what is the species that you make on the surface. Yeah, but of course, you can find out when you, if you have a surface where, on which you know where the atoms are. So these are infrared spectra taken at different coverages with this molecule bound to the surface. You have to analyze them, assign the bands. And then in the end, you can come up with a model that tells you how these molecules bind to the surface. And we can sh show, for example, that if you are under very dilute conditions, this molecule binds as a chelating tridentate yeah, with three legs of the phosphonic acid to the surface. And then 
<clears throat> if it becomes more crowded in the surface, it starts to bind with two legs, uh, but it's always uh, strongly bound to the surface. So that's UHV. And now we can do exactly the same experiment uh, under electrochemical conditions. We make the cobalt oxide film in UHV. We transfer it into the solution with the phosphonic acid. And then we do an infrared experiment to understand how these molecules bind to the surface. <clears throat> Sorry. And uh, remember, infrared experiments are always different experiments, as, as I said. No? So we have a reference potential. We jump to a different potential and go back uh, and always do these steps and look at differences. Uh, and these are the different spectra that you see in, um, in S polarization. In S polarization, uh, you hardly see anything. Uh, it tells you that there's nothing going on in solution. Yeah, uh, that's good. No, the molecules don't dissolve, nothing going on. In P polarization, there's a very strong buffer as well. So what you find out in the end is that as a function of the potential at low coverage, um, uh, these molecules basically change their orientation as a function of the pot potential, whereas at high coverages, um, what you see is a protonation, a partial protonation of the phosphonic acid, um, but still the molecules remain attached to the surface with two legs, yeah, and you're not going to lose it from the surface, even if you lose one leg, uh, two legs are enough uh, to stand on the surface. Yeah? So this is the big advantage with this phosphonic acid uh, anchor. It's, it's very stable. Yeah, and then uh, the, the holy grail is, of course, to use that knowledge uh, then to understand really functional films. Yeah? So, uh, for instance, we're looking at porphyrins on this oxide surface. Porphyrins are big molecules like you see here. Uh, so they have this core where you can put um, metal ions and then they can form, perform all kinds of function, functions, catalytic uh, sensor functions, uh, uh, all kinds of things. Yeah, and you can attach these molecules with the same linker group, yeah, again, with this phosphonic acid. Yeah, so that's what we do. And we do it in exactly the same way by preparing the system, which we anchoring the molecule and then doing the spectroscopy. And by uh, looking at the spectra, then we can identify the same bands and can tell how this big functional molecule in the end binds to the surface um, or not. Okay, so with this, I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, I hope I could show you in the second part <clears throat> that it's, um, yeah, that it, that it can be really fruitful to use this mo model approach uh, to understand um, yeah, electrochemical interfaces. And I showed four examples, well-defined oxide interfaces where we um, try to understand the interaction with water. We try to understand the structural dynamics of these oxides under potential control, um, and also the stability and dissolution of the potential control. I showed you this catalyst nanoparticles of oxide, showed you that they're strong electronic, uh, that they are metal, electronic metal support interactions uh, that can be used to modify uh, the particles and also to anchor the particles. We can look at the catalytic activity in the electrolyte yeah, and show how we can control the electronic structure and stability. I showed you these ionic liquids as um, uh, catalytic modifiers. Uh, yeah, we can understand how these ions interact with surface in ultra vacuum and then use this knowledge to design interactions such that we can control reactions. Yeah, and I show you, showed you one example, one first example where we can control the selectivity in electrocatalytic reaction. And finally, I showed you this more material oriented um, example, functional organic films on oxides now, where we again try to understand how to assemble these um, molecules under vacuum conditions, how these systems grow, and then bring these uh, systems into an electrochemical environment uh, to study their functionality. Now, I have to point out that, of course, uh, I have, haven't done any of these experiments. I have to confess uh, these experiments, beautiful experiments have been done all by many people in my group, and I've listed here the names, so the names in white are the people that are in the group and gray that people that have contributed and have left the group already. 
Um, in particular, I would like to um, mention the contributions by uh, Olaf Brummel. Uh, Olaf Brummel is uh, heading the electrochemical uh, subgroup in my group uh, and is uh, responsible for all these beautiful chemical experiments. And Jaroslava Likac, uh, she is responsible for the uh, synchrotron radiation um, facility experiments in my, um, my group. And uh, she's responsible for all that beautiful work. Yeah, but also the other contributors. Uh, so um, um, uh, this is, by the way, a picture of the group of Martin Hartmann and my group, the Erlang Center for Interface Research and Catalysis. I mentioned already all the cooperation partners or many of the cooperation partners. Um, I should also mention all the funding sources that give us the money to do these uh, um, beautiful um, experiments. And I, I should also mention that this is, of course, not a picture uh, of the group from this year. This is, of course, a picture of the group from last year. Uh, pictures of the group uh, from, current, from, from, from nowadays look like this. this is a picture of, uh, from, the, from our um, Christmas party. Online meetings can also uh, be fun. But of course, uh, real meetings at conferences are even more fun. Um, yeah, I would like to thank you all for, um, for listening to this presentation. Uh, I'll ho I, hope for, uh, I hope to meet you maybe at some point uh, at a conference to discuss in person some of these ideas and challenges. And uh, of course, I'll be uh, very happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jörg. Um, I, I think everyone here really appreciates such a um, broad coverage of so many techniques. I think this is the first time that we see uh, such a technique focused, at the same time also, of course, scientifically focused talk. Um, um, I think everyone is open for questions, so please feel free to use your microphone to ask questions. Uh, maybe I will start and then whoever is next, please um, can raise your hand or you can just directly ask. Um, so uh, one gen general question that I have, um, is related to the double layer. So in the electrochemical experiments, we mostly are concerned, of course, about the double layer. I know that in the past, a long time ago, I'm not sure about today, but in the past, uh, surface scientists tried to use the deposition of metals, especially the alkali earth metals, uh, alkali metals and so on, which have a different work function than the substrate, um, as a way to mimic that charge transfer at the surface, right? To make that interface. So is it something that people are still trying to do today? And if not, are there any ways to maybe better ways to, um, to um, sort of mimic and imitate mm -hmm. that double layer in the UHV conditions? Uh, yeah, I think this, these are very, um, yeah, very important experiments. You mean this, uh, for instance, by, by Viva and I think uh, also Mark Krupa and, and so on, uh, this um, fundamental work. Um, so I think it's, it's um, it's, uh, it's very important uh, experiments that show you what the electric field does um, to adsorbates. Yeah? So to calibrate basically uh, the effect of the electric field. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not aware of um, too much work in, uh, along that line at, at, at present, I have to say, um, but I think it has, has uh, basically paved the way um, to, to many of the experiments that are done today. So I think the main focus uh, today is really um, along this more instrumental path. Uh, so to develop instruments that allow you to really look at this interface under potential control. Uh, if you think about this photoelectron spectroscopy experiments, in principle, these experiments would allow you to apply or to, to generate an electric field and also vary the electric field if you get the chance to really vary the potential and at the same time do a surface science experiment. So I think this is, uh, this is the main focus at the, uh, at, the, at, at the moment because it's also more, uh, you, you have more of a handle um, on the system. Um, of course, you can try to deposit something, make a field, um, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's in a way very artificial. It is not, not really, uh, you, you cannot really bridge to the electrochemical conditions in a, in a way that you can really 
very continuously and then then look at direction. So um, I think it's it's important fundamental experiments. Um, but I'm maybe I missed something. Not aware of very strong activities along these lines. Okay. Also, yeah. Um, anyone has questions that anyone wants to answer? Me. The audience can correct me. From one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I hope that somebody will ask direct questions. So I can see that there are questions in the chat. Please use uh, the microphone. I'm, I don't want to read such long questions. It would be difficult, please. Okay, many questions in the chat, so we have to go one by one, I guess. That's okay. Andrew, maybe no, I can, go ahead. Andrew, maybe I can ask a question. Um, Hans Georg here from former former Erlangen. Um, oh, hello, hello. <laughs> I, I was wondering for the electrochemical STM, is it actually possible to learn something about the structure and the orientation of the water molecules near the surface by looking at the tunneling current or its, its distance dependence or by comparing it to theory? Because I guess the tunneling or the, yeah, the barrier is modulated by how the water molecules are aligned near the surface. Yeah, I think this is a very difficult question. Yeah, so um, in, the, in the electrochemical, of course, in the SDM, you can image water. No, so there are many experiments where people look at water structure on surfaces by SDM, no, typically under cryogenic conditions. Yeah, they can image the water, but of course, the, uh, under electrochemical conditions uh, in the electrochemical uh, SDM, normally not. No? What you can image is adsorbates on the surface if they assemble and are stable enough, uh, are stable on the time scale of the SDM experiments, yeah. So if you have the electrolyte specifically absorbing at the interface, you can you can image the specifically absorbed electrolyte ions. Now that is possible. In for some electrolytes, like for these ionic liquids that I mentioned, uh, there are also fascinating experiments where these interfacial layers of the ionic liquids have been imaged as a function of potential. Uh, by, by electrochemical microscopy. So there it's possible, mainly because we form relatively rigid uh, structures um, um, as a function of potential, so there's, they, 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 it's easier. Uh, but but uh, imaging, uh, if you're heading for imaging individual water molecules at an interface, I think that is, uh, that is beyond yeah. the technique. Well, I was also thinking, if you measure the absolute tunneling current, and then you have, say, your, your, your tip is three water molecules away. You, and then you have the layered water near the interface. You have kind of this maybe layered kind of tunneling barrier. And this layered tunneling barrier will give, uh, give be the origin of some very specific tunneling current. And maybe you can, maybe someone can model this and calculate that. Yeah, I would, I would say this is, this is, is possible. Yeah, it is possible. Um, the, the challenge with the electrochemical SDM experiment is that it's orders of magnitude more complex than a UHV uh, SDM um, experiment. Yeah, and normally you're extremely happy if you have a reasonable image at all. Uh, so um, uh, typically this, this very detailed questions under very controlled conditions that you are used to, um, to answer in a outdoor vacuum SDM experiments they are typically way beyond the electrochemical SDM experiment. Yeah, so this is basically the main message. Uh, it's, it's really two worlds. Yeah, it's, it's not comparable in terms of stability, uh, reproducibility, and range of conditions that you can apply. Yeah, so this is certainly, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's, it's unthinkable, but I think it's just difficult. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yes, Arthur, go ahead. Great. Um, so my question has to do with your 2,3 butane diol oxidation experiments. So your hypothesis is that the uh, anion SO3 F3 would effectively poison the surface and not allow uh, prevent uh, basically the pairing reaction from occurring. I'm curious whether you guys tried decreasing the anion concentration to the point where it's 
submonolayer coverage. And if, if that's the case, what are you observing increase in the, what's the yeah. last product? The, um, right, right. Yeah. So we, we, systematically, we systematically varied the concentration. Um, it's, it's on an Equish solution, by the way. No? So we systematically varied the concentration of the IL in Equish solution. Uh, and looked at the reactivity and the selectivity. And what you see is that you, um, that you get this selectivity effect already at quite low concentrations of the ionic liquid. No? So it's, uh, you, it has a strong effect. And if you then further increase uh, the concentration, the activity is, is very strongly suppressed. Yeah? So it, if you go to higher concentration, the, the, the surface becomes inactive quite, quite fast. Uh, so it's, it's very sensitive. Cool. Thank you. Um, if I may ask the next question. Um, thanks very much. That was a beautiful talk. I'm a theorist, actually. So thank you for making it simple enough for even us in the audience. Um, I'm interested in the following. I'm interested in experimental evidence in an electrochemical environment for an adsorbate such as o, molecular O2 that doesn't have a dipole. So um, do you have any good suggestions for what I could ask my experimental friends to do? I can do MD and they're beautiful, but um, we're ha I'm having trouble understanding what experimental probe to use, I could use for that. Thank you. So you want an experiment uh, for O2 at the uh, electrochemical inter inter interface and you want to see the O2? On a metal, okay. exactly. On, on a metal interface. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, uh, infrared spectroscopy is a bad choice uh, there. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pity. Uh, otherwise, we would have done a lot on uh, on, oxid uh, on oxygen absorption and, and reaction. Um, yeah, in principle, um, uh, in principle, uh, photoelectron spectroscopy would be uh, one of the one of the experiments that should be feasible. Of course, you're dealing with the issue that there's a lot of oxygen in the system if you're water around. Yeah, but um, on the end, in a, in a different spectrum, you may be able uh, to see oxygen at the surface, for instance, in an electrochemical uh, photoelectron spectroscopy experiment. So this is something that one can try if one wants to work on single crystals, for instance. Now, if you um, if you don't need to work on single crystal, certainly there are, there are other, uh, there may maybe other spectroscopies. So, but um, I think that's, that's what I would try next. Thank you. Um, okay, maybe I can also ask a quick question um, related to uh, the maybe different type of electrochemistry, because I'm sure there are many people who work with batteries and intercalated materials. So do you know other groups or any efforts where people are assessing or they're using surface science to understand that behavior of, of the intercalation behavior related to, for example, the batteries and of course related to SCI and so on, uh, because I know there are plenty of efforts, of course, uh, but those are mostly coming from material science scientists and electrochemists, pure electrochemists, but very few from where I've never seen actually any. Uh, from the surface science. Yeah, I, I have to admit, uh, I'm not into the field of uh, batteries. Yeah, so I'm really an outsider in the battery field. Um, so uh, maybe I'm will be not the perfect person to ask, uh, but certainly uh, there are attempts where people combine battery-related uh, research uh, with um, with surface science. So, um, for instance, uh, at Ulm University. Um, is, uh, uh, there's a lot of activity, uh, so um, there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of work on this ionic liquids um, battery related, um, uh, where people um, like Frank Andres um, or Rob Atkins looked at um, looked at uh, ionic liquid interfaces, electrode interfaces, with the idea. That this may have to do with with um, uh, with, uh, with batteries. Yeah, so I, I think there are there is some work, yeah, but unfortunately, I have to, have to say it's, it's not uh, it's well, not something not. that we're doing. 
Yes, I would see. So you maybe maybe that's that will be a topic for another uh, for another <laughs> presentation. Oh, uh, if we find the right person, for sure. Uh, um, I think Vanessa, do you have still another question? No, thanks. That was uh, okay. I'm, I'm satisfied. Okay. Thank you. Your hand is up. Um, all right. Maybe I can just finish then with the last question, which will be a little bit provocative. But I'm curious what you can say. So we know that surface scientists are very picky about what type of the surface they work with, what type of samples. They, they are really careful with any sort of liquids, whatever gases that they, you know, many people really don't like it. So if we have to talk to a surface scientists and get them interested in electrochemistry, what would be the best way? What would you say to them that electrochemistry is interesting because of you, they should not be afraid of electrochemistry? Because this gap, I think, is still largely because of this um, uh, fear of, of sort of some um, contamination and, and not a perfect uh, environment. Yeah, um, what can I say? Uh, I think, first of all, uh, I think the situation has changed a lot over the last years. Yeah, so I think uh, when I look back um, 10 or 15 years, uh, and you would have proposed the experiments that many groups are doing today, people would have said, uh, how can you? Yeah, and, um, and I think there, there's been a lot of change. So I think um, most of the people in surface science, they, they either um, have a perspective into the direction of catalysis where they work under hostile environment that is high pressures, or they have a connection to uh, electrochemistry, where they work in uh, in connection to hostile environment, that is uh, liquids, yeah? and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that is uh, maybe there are some other uh, relations yeah, to material science and so on. So there's a there's a strong application um, um, focus on uh, application, and I think for that reason, many people are aware of this uh, this, this potential of their methods. Um, of course, uh, yeah, one thing is, uh, of course, the methodology. Yeah? So the, the, the experiments uh, in surface science are so different from the experimentation in electrochemistry that it's, it's, it's a completely different world. Yeah? So as I said, uh, I'm, I'm by, by, by education, I'm a surface scientist, yeah? not an electrochemist. And uh, we're doing electrochemistry now in our group for maybe, I don't know, 10 years. Or a little bit less, and we really had to work hard uh, to get all this expertise aboard um, how to work with clean surfaces. Yeah, it's it's really a pain, and it's really a different world. And uh, what can you do? Uh, well, you can talk uh, to the others, and of course, you can. The best thing is you can have conferences together. Yeah? So uh, I think that's the way to go. Yeah, and if you if you see a lot. Uh, from these other experiments, you realize maybe it's not so different, apart from the fact that is um, that the one uh, one person uses vacuum to fill a vessel, and the other person uses uh, liquid to fill a vessel, and in the end, the experiments are the same. Yeah, and uh, that would be uh, ideal if if this is if this is the same. It's only it's the only filling of the vessel, and um, I think this is uh, this is something that becomes more and more apparent in both communities. So uh, my, my, um, yeah, my uh, suggestion is uh, have, have seminars like the one here, uh, have, uh, have, uh, have uh, conferences where you bring these things together and I think that will happen automatically. Great. So looks like um, it's time for a conference now. That would be great. That would be great. That'd be great. Uh, all right. Um, thank you so much, Jörg. Um, it was really great, great talk. I, I, I personally learned a lot of interesting details that I've never heard of. And I'm sure our um, um, audience was also quite engaged because I can see that uh, a lot of people stayed until the end. So it's really good. Um, uh, so I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. So we hope to see everyone um, in two weeks for our last colloquium this semester which will be devoted to electrochemical impedance. So thank you so much and have a nice day, evening or morning, depending on your time. Thanks, Andrew, it was a pleasure.